and uh, welcome to those that follow this through the internet. This is kind of like a heart-to-heart -heart talk uh, from Psalm 62. We might also go past that, but let's see. Father, we thank you for your riches. We are justified by grace through the redemption that is in Yeshua, our Messiah. Our Messiah, Messiah of Israel, King of the world, but also our Messiah. So, Father, as many things happen in the world, you're fulfilling many things, setting up the world ready to fulfill your prophecy plan. At the same time, you're doing something very beautiful, very deep in us. We're in our weakness. Your strength is made perfect. We lack righteousness in ourselves. But we're not supposed to have it in ourselves. Our righteousness is in you. Yeshua is our righteousness. Yeshua, the Messiah, is our fellowship with God, with you, Father. He is our fellowship. and That's why we're so safe. We're so safe based on that grace that is eternally set in the heavens. But we need more of you. We are secure in this grace, but we don't take it lightly. We don't take it like something to be wasted, but we take it <coughs> in a way that we just want to draw near, draw near, draw near, draw nigh. Heaven is reality. Heaven's kingdom is reality. And the kingdom of the evil one is also real. But we are in your kingdom. And we pray that we would see various things through your eyes. Ourselves, your counsel, and the people that you have created to glorify you. Let us see through your eyes. But let us also touch your feeling about these things. Let us live in your mind, eternal mind, but also in your sense, sense of life. It's feelings, but it's more than feelings. It's living in the life-giving spirit. And our willingness so much often we lack willingness. You are our ability. You give us willingness as we touch you. So whatever we lack, let us not look so much to our lack as we look to your supply. You are our supply. It says in your word that forever your word is settled in the heavens. That you set your word above all your name. In the name of Yeshua, we thank you for that. Amen. So this is an amazing thing. God has set his word above his name. Now, think about it for a second. This is unbelievable. Because like we meet someone and we say our name, my name is Benjamin, my name is Ramona, my name is... Yaakov, or Ariel, whatever, we are showing and revealing something about ourselves. But that's not everything we are revealing. God has given us his name. But when we say his name, he has multiple names, but that can be, can be gathered into one name. And the name in which he reveals everything is the name of his son, Yeshua. Yes, 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 yes. But God has also multiple names. But he has set his word above all his name. So his, word, his name is, his name and names is what he's revealing to us. 
You remember in, Re in Revelation, in John, Yohanan, chapter 17, what does our Lord Yeshua say? I've given to them your name. I've revealed to them your name to these 12 disciples. I've revealed to you who you are. I've given your name to them. And when they've been watching me in my speeches, in my actions, feeding the poor, giving grace to the weak, multiplying the bread, and even raising some dead, I've revealed your name, your nature, who you are. But he said his word above all his name. It means simply, it means more than I can ever say, but it means the supply is always more than we can receive. There's always more of God than we can take. This is amazing. This is amazing. There's always more than what we can take. Our fellowship with God is in these two poles. Psalm 42, you remember? The deep calleth unto the deep. The deep is calling unto the deep. That's the deep. That's the depth of my need. That's the depth of your need. That's the depth of our nation. We have a national need. We need to know the Messiah. We need salvation. We need peace. But above all, we need forgiveness. Isaiah 53 and new life. Our need is a great depth. But deep calls to the deep. There's a depth in the heart of God. God is like waiting. Come to me again. It is his glory to meet our need. It is his glory. It is God's glory. Glory of the Messiah to wash the disciples' feet. That's his glory. That's his glory. You remember what the problem was in uh, Laodicea, Laodicea? The problem was the people said, I have a need of nothing. I have need of nothing. I don't need. I was in a prayer meeting in Washington State. I believe it was 2002 or three, about maybe 2004. They were professional people, school teachers, music teachers, businessmen. Uh, uh, they were dressed well, uh, like me now. <laughs> well, they were dressed better. And they had a prayer meeting. And I was shocked the way they prayed. I hadn't heard such prayers since uh, 35, 30, 40 years when I visited the underground congregations in the Soviet Union and those countries. They were crying out, Lord, give me more need of you. Lord, Give me more need of you. Lord, give me more need of you. They were crying with their hearts. Lord, give me more need of you. Because they understood the difference between the Philadelphian spirit and Laodike Laodikea, Laodicean spirit. Yes. Because you, it used to be when you go to the East, the people are praying like this. Let me really know you in my heart. Give me more need of you. I need to be changed, Lord. It's only your power and your grace that can change me. And in the West, the prayers were, were how can I change the world? How can I change the world? Hell, okay, not to put that down. Not to put that down either. But I'm just saying, we first need that cry. I have more need of you. And then when the heart is changed, the world, it will begin to affect the world. It's a different way. And the key word for this change is really hesed, the covenant grace. Uh, I was reading the word of God when I 
had some time out. Some other plans didn't work out, but this, by God, did work out. And when I read about this matter that we need God's heart, we need his mood, we need his wisdom, his mind, his word, yes, but we need to be connected to his heart. Moses, Moses, welcome, Moses. Moses, welcome. Um, uh, not that Moses came into our meeting, I say to the <laughs> camera, but someone, someone who is, has a very special walk with the Lord in his grace came into the meeting. So I, I was just thinking of the topic of disappointments. Have you had any disappointments in the last five years? Am I the only one that has had disappointments? I don't think so. I really don't think so. But there's one person who had disappointment. It is Moses. Moses was the prince of Egypt. He was getting ready to be the king, Pharaoh, the great leader of the known world at the moment. The world leader. The world leader. He left that to join himself to the people of Israel. Then he thought, He's going to, I've got strength, I've got power. I'm going to show these people what, they, what evil they do. It didn't work out. He ended up killing a man. The Bible doesn't use the word murder there, but it says killed. He killed a man. He had to take a 40-year vacation. He had to take a 40-year vacation, and he found a job. He found a job in the wilderness and a wonderful wife called Zipporah. But that emptied him of all his plans. Then God called him in the burning bush. God met him, commissioned him. He was emptied of all the wisdom he had learned. He had learned all this wisdom in 40 years. Acts 7 says he was schooled in all the wisdom of Egypt. Some of them were bad things. Some of them were supremely technological things. Some of them was stuff that we don't even want to look, on, look at because it was uh, kind of magic. But some of it was very wise, very technical. He was a wise man. Left it in a wilderness. He got a call. Finally, he kicks into his call, and by God's grace, by raising his staff, he could open the sea. I mean, God did it. <laughs> we give God all the grace. I need some peppermint here. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Then he takes on the task, 40 years, leading the people. The people behaved so bad. They worshipped idols after all these miracles. They murmured, they complained. Twice he saved the people by, at least twice, maybe even three times. Oh, you count it. He saved the people by praying without bread and without any water, 40 days without eating and drinking. He gave himself as a living sacrifice that God supernaturally would keep him alive. And he did. He saved the whole nation. Only his descendants would have been alive. God said, I'll wipe out everybody. I'll wipe out everybody if I'll wipe out everybody. Of oh, you, may I make a great nation. Moses says, no, you cannot. You cannot. You lose your reputation. 
and also he loved the people. Okay, this went on and on and on. He suffered. He was the meekest man. They challenged him, and God stood up for him and swallowed Korah and his company. Number 16, and this went on and on. And then at the very end of his life, before getting to the promised land, he had been waiting for this 40 years. I can take the people now over. The people provoked him. They provoked his spirit. They were complaining so heavily. God said, speak to the rock. Speak to the rock, and I will cause water to come out of this rock. Not from a water bottle, but from the rock. And he, that moment, he got really angry. He smote the rock and he said, do I have to give water to you? Spoke harshly. And what did God answer to Moses? We have to really understand these sentences. God said, you did not glorify me. You did not glorify me at those waters. You did not glorify me. What does that mean? It means... Moses did not show the heart of God to the people. God was not angry. The people had complained. God knew that. Moses had saved them so many times by his prayers and guided them and helped them. But this one mistake was so bad. Actually, it was God's eternal plan that Shasu had to take him in. But in Moses' mind, in Moses' mind, this one thing, Lord, can we talk one more time about it? God says, no, speak no more to me about it. It wasn't angry. God wasn't angry with Moses. He really knew his heart. But he was decided. He was determined. It was, like we say in Hebrew, muhlat, nothing more, muhlat, nothing more to talk about it. So he was decidedly saying, don't talk to me more about that. It wasn't in anger, but it's like, Moses, no, let's not go there. Okay, so what was so bad about it? God wanted to show them kindness and grace after they were so tired. Yes, they were very bad so many times, but God wanted to show kindness, and Moses showed sternness. So, Moses was disappointed. He was so disappointed. But God said, okay, go to the top of the mountain. I know you love this land. I know. You live to bring the people here. You suffered all this. But I'm going to give you a special tour. Go to the top of the mountain and I'll show you all the land. I show you all the land, all the way to Lebanon, to uh, Tel Aviv, <laughs> well, to the sea coast and the south. I showed you the whole thing. With your eyes, you will see it. You won't walk there, though. You'll see it. Okay. I have been on those mountains on the east side in the land of Jordan. I wasn't in Pisgah, but I was in the other mountain that's very similar, which is where high priest Aharon died. I went there, and I had even a Hebrew shofar under my jacket. I even blew it on the top of the mountain, and we prayed. It's a big story, but I don't want to repeat that story. Okay, but I can tell you one thing. There is no such mountain there that by natural eyes you can see all this field, all the way to Lebanon, all the way to the Western Sea, which is called Mediterranean, and all these areas. No, you cannot. But here is the thing. Moses walked as high as he could with his natural, with his feet as far as he could. And as he began to look, God 
cause him to see what cannot be naturally seen. My friends, there are some things that we do not get now that we would like to get, but God makes up for it. God gave him, gave him eyesight, and God can give us eyesight into his riches, into his grace. Messiah is spiritually our promised land. Israel is physically the promised land, but Messiah is our promised land. This is a huge topic. In the Messiah, there are deep valleys. There's even the Dead Sea Valley, where we, when we are low, he lifts us up from the Dead Sea Valley to the sea level. Every time we fail, we're somehow in those valleys. God has made it part of the promised land. It's all in the plan. Also our failures, our needs. May our need be as deep as the Dead Sea. <laughs> May our need be as deep as the Dead Sea. But actually, everybody has an equal need. But the problem is people are blind. They don't see the need for God's goodness, God's grace, God's mercy, and God's power. There's grace and there's power. Amen. So, so that is amazing. And then he saw what he saw. And God made up for Moses. He, he needed to wait only uh, 1,400 years but where was he waiting? With God. He was in paradise. He was in paradise. He wasn't uh, in soul sleep. He was in paradise. And he, he was in the presence of God. Abraham's bosom. He was. It, it wasn't bad. God made up for it. But then 1,400 years later, when the Messiah... The baby was born in Bethlehem, grew up, did all his miracles. Okay, then there was a special escort, couple of special wagons, horses, chariots, whatever. I don't know how they came. Two men, Moshe and Eliha. And they could have that special talk with Yeshua that no one else could have. Yeshua is entering into the most difficult week in his life. Who is going to be with him? These two special friends. And my goodness, the disciples fell asleep when, when they were listening to this. They fell asleep. That's what we are many times, you know. But let's go to Psalm 62. Think about this. I, I really want to say this to all of us. If we have disappointments, let's not, don't let the disappointments drive you into loose living. How many people have had such bad disappointments? Somebody died, they didn't get something that they believed God is going to give them speedily. Something happened. And many people have walked away from fellowship with God. They have backslidden big time because of disappointment, because the devil is waiting with his claws and he's coming. You see, God is not good. The promises are no good. No, 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 no. No, no, forget it. Forget it. You're no good anyway. He comes with accusations and he uses disappointments, hurts, grievances, hurts. He uses those. And in those disappointments, we must use faith and believe this, that if God takes away something, I should better say, if he allows a situation that people or circumstances take away from us something. God will give us always something better. Not the same day, maybe, 
Not the same week, maybe. Sometime it is the same week. Sometime it's years later. But God will always more than make up for it. This is our faith. We're ready to die for this. We're ready to live for this. God is good. God cannot be anything less than good. His word is good. Devil is a liar. World system is a liar. My own heart is a liar when it does not join what God says. So when disappointments come, God will make up for it. Amen. Amen. I believe all of us would have a story if we talk about disappointments. And God gave Moses eyes to see what no one else has seen except Yeshua in this promised land, to see in one view all of it. And God gives us eyes to see. Ephesians 1, 17, 18, 19, those riches that are hidden in the body and in the word, in the body of his son and in the word. It's, yeah, it's all in the body, but it's not just that we, no, I do drink coffee, but it's not just when we drink coffee and talk about the weather. That's, that's good too for warm up. But then when we talk about those riches, one person sharing with another, the Holy Spirit gets into the fellowship and things open up, our understanding opens up, and we see, wow, how good is God? How good is God? How good is God? And also we see one thing. Our spirit knows more than our mind, our head knows right now. Our spirit knows more. That's the hope of glory. That's what First Peter talks about, that we rejoice <coughs> with joy unspeakable and full of glory. We rejoice even in those things that we have not seen yet, whom having not seen, we believe. In one way, people that have had visions of Yeshua, they can be very true if it's a crucif <laughs> crucified Yeshua. But in one sense, this is not an advantage because every all of us, we rejoice seeing him who is unseen by faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we should start reading now the word of God. Actually, we didn't read any verses yet, but we spoke the word of God. Psalm 62. To the chief musician, to Yeruthun. Yeruthun, that's like uh, Yedid. Uh, it's a love language. The Psalm of David, Song of David. Truly, verily, my soul waiteth upon God. From him is my salvation, or cometh my salvation. Our soul is made to wait on God. So the more the need, the better. The deeper the need, the better. So sometimes we are conscious of the need, but sometimes we are conscious of the glory of God. Our spiritual life always works in this two poles. God is so good. I want to hear his word. I want to hear his grace. I want to hear his goodness. I want to want to hear his loving kindness. I want to hear his promises. I want to hear his eternal counsels from eternity past to eternity future. Give me the word. It's full of glory, hope, grace, holiness, glory. Give me his word. This is the goodness of God flowing. But then sometimes it is like Oh, God, I don't even know if I have any capacity. I'm in trouble. Either way, he'll end up bringing glory to him. And by the way, sometime when, that's just my experience, sometime when I'm in the depth of my need, I feel like, 
I'm not in, in emotionalism, but there are moments when we really are in, in dire need, when we feel the need and our flesh seems to be so much present and maybe our nose is on, on the dust. In those moments, we taste something of the sweetness of his grace. That's to me when I have the deepest desire to find somebody who is down and out to tell them about this God. Or someone like that old man on the seat who is so lonely, so lonely, so lonely, so needy. One needy talking to another needy. My soul waited upon God. From him comes my salvation. So I'm not confused from which direction my help and my salvation comes. It doesn't come from my wisdom. It doesn't come from my ideas. It comes from the Lord. It can come in a song. It can come through a scripture. It can come from a brother or sister in a meeting. It can come even by watching the birds. But God will say something, and it is God. Anything else is a channel. The source is God. I don't despise channels. I listen to internet, the wonderful meetings, and especially from Baltimore and other places. I listen to the word of God. I listen. I read sometimes the pilgrim portions. I listen to devotionals. I love channels. I love to sit with people. But people are channels. The source is God. If every channel is taken away from us, we still say, from him comes my salvation. Amen. We have a brother here, uh, Brother Lev, who lives in a special city. It's called Ashkelon. It's a historic city near the sea. He has been through more than nine, more than nine months. Uh, well, sometimes he travels, but he spent under these rockets and rockets and rockets and rockets and rockets. It is not easy, but the source of our salvation is God. Sometimes it is health tests, relationship tests. Then it says, verse 2, He only is my rock. Only, only, I love this. He only is my rock. It's not enough to say for him, he is my rock. He is my rock, yeah. He only, no other rock. And my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. I can be moved a little bit. I can stumble. My eyes can be wandering. I can be distracted. I can say rash things out of my mouth. I can fail momentarily. I need forgiveness. I can be moved, but here it says, not greatly moved. You see? Is that your experience? Am I the only one that sometimes stumbles? Am I the only one? Okay, but in the same psalm, later on, he says in verse 6, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. So sometimes it is, I shall not be greatly moved. But when the faith is stronger by grace again, when our living in grace is stronger, we say, I shall not be moved. Not greatly moved. I had a little bad day here, a little bit more bad day there, but I'm not greatly moved. It doesn't cause me to stay down because I know who God is. You know, there's a deep knowledge of God's goodness in our hearts. When something devastating could happen, maybe almost as devastating as what happened to Moses, and we just can't even lift our head. But in our heart we say, 
But I know, I know in my heart, God is good. Give me, all the information can be thrown at my face. This is bad. That's bad. There's nothing good on coming on my way. Uh, all the information is against me. Like Jacob was given the information. Here's the quote. Joseph is dead. It's a false uh, evidence. It's devil's false evidence. It's dead. Your son is dead. In those moments, we know my heart has touched grace. I know if he went to the tree for my sins, if he born on a tree, all of the sins of the world and my worst sins and anyone's sins, if he bore all the sins on that cross, he is good. How shall he not with him freely give us all these things? My mind may be confused, but my heart knows more. What is the situation of the nation of Israel right now? What is it? What is it? It's like this. There's a heart after God. In thousands of people, there's heart after God. What are they doing? They're reading Psalms. They're looking for information. Their mind is not yet there, but they are on the way. Let us be patient. Same goes for the Arabic speakers. The Arabic population also. There's many people that are looking for God, but what they've been told from a little child is wrong information. It's also for these religious communities, whether they be Arabic speaking or whatever, the traditional churches, they need more light. We know God in the deep places, in the deep places, in the deep valleys. And what we gain in the valleys, those are the things we do not lose. Ah, that, there's another message coming from there. But let me just say a couple of more verses. Let's read a little more Bible. How long will ye imagine mischief? Psalm 62, verse 3. Against a man, I'm only a man. Ye shall be slain, all of you. He talks that about his enemies. And we, have, we, we don't struggle against flesh and blood. But in this case, it is David's enemies. As a bowing, bowing wall shall he be, as a tottering fence. So you'll come down. Just call it. You'll come down. What that's what he's saying. The only con they only consult to cast him down from his excellency. He's talking about his own soul and well-being. They delight in lies. Oh, there are a lot of people that delight in lies. We don't want to delight in lies. No, no, no. Because of the wonderful God, we love the truth. We love God's reality. We love the truth. I'm the way, the truth, and the light. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Selah. I love those selahs. Verse 5. My soul, wait thou only upon God. Okay. Compare this with verse 1. In verse 1 he says, my soul waiteth upon God. But now it is the only. My soul wait thou only upon God. So when it's only upon God, the direction of our trust is more refined. We are delivered from illusions. That's a growth of grace. God is a deeper source. Okay, I hope you understand that. I hope I understand that. For my expectation is from him. He only is my rock. And when he puts that only word there, then it comes out and my salvation, I shall not be moved. If I have only one source I'm looking to, I will not be moved. I'm looking to him, but not quite as perfectly. 
I could be a little bit moved. Amazing wisdom in these Psalms. I found out that the wisdom of grace, a walk with God, in Psalms is so deep. You could spend on one Psalm hours. Sometimes I take one Psalm, I take an hour, two hours, read it again and again, pray over it, read it again and again, and pray over it. And I notice every time, how didn't I see that before? That these, these are the wells of salvation, wells of salvation that make us hungry. And then, okay, verse 7, In God is my salvation and my glory. Ah, the rock of my strength. He is underneath me. Even if I fall, I fall on a rock. I'm not going to be moved. I, I'm on a rock. I'm established on eternal salvation. God is my eternal salvation. He's my refuge. My refuge is in God. And he goes on and on. But I'm going to just close here because I don't want to make this too long. Verse 11. God has spoken once. He just spoke. Twice have I heard it. God has spoken once. I hear, need to hear it again. Same way, like you remember the kosher animals? Cows, such animals. They chew the cut. They eat it once. It goes to one stomach. Then it comes up again. They chew it again. Mm, that's like Miriam, the mother of Yeshua, pondered these things in his heart. People, I mean, animals that don't chew the cut, there's also, they have to divide the hoof, the foot. But if they don't chew the cut, they're not kosher. Uh, you know, people who meditate and let the word become life, spirit and life in them, let it speak back to us. This type of fellowship is the fellowship that feeds us, that comes from deep places, uh, deep places. Uh, we are not ignorant of the news. We use them for prayer, but we must be very careful that it's not so much news, that it's not more this. It's a fine line. We have to be very careful. We are, we, we are, we're not stupid people. We're not stupid people. We know, at least we read a little Jerusalem Post or something, whatever. But news is not above the Bible. The word of God. God has spoken once and twice have I heard it. That power belongs to God. Oh, mine. With words, he created the heavens and the earth. But the power of his son is greater. It takes more power, grace power, to make us from people of the flesh that are so carnal, that are so <laughs> self-defensive, so much in self, 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 me, 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 to turn us into saints. This is greater power. It's called new creation. Yeah, yeah, this is greater power, which he worked in his son when he raised him from the dead. Oh, I'm poor. I am needy. That's why I need to hear this again and again. Yes, again and again. Yes, yes. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongs mercy. The word, I believe, is hesed, grace. Yes, power belongs to you, but it doesn't stop there. Also to you belongs hesed, grace. So in other words, thy loving kindness, thy grace is better than even life. 
even the life power. For thou renderest to every man according to his word. Now the context is interesting. We are rewarded by responding to God's grace. We respond by hearing the word of grace. And I say, I confess my sin and I turn from my sin and receive the gift of God. Then when God speaks about who he is, I resp- my works is by responding to him. I don't want my self-life. I want your word. I want to hear. I want to listen. And then I become the doer of the word. Doer of the word, like James says. I become a lover so that my being is waiting to find the opportunities where to implement the goodness of God, to give it out. And believe me, the opportunities are not lacking. One of them is to show patience to people, to uh, turn the other cheek and all that. But we don't do it like, oh, I have to put up with this. It comes from this, thy loving kindness. Okay, I think we've spoken long enough uh, this time. Thank you for hearing these uh, topics of prayer. Lord, do we dare to pray deepen our need for you? Yes, we dare to pray that, but deepen our vision of your goodness, of your greatness, your love. You are the source of it. I don't do anything to make you love us. And let us pray for this sick world, Lord. Help us to pray for the people around us, people next door. Show them kindness and goodness, and that will turn to testimony as often as you want. We don't force, we don't push, but we are the testimony. We are the testimony of God. In Yeshua's name, Amen.